good morning. It's good to be here with y'all Journey folks. I'm Pastor Jennifer, if we haven't met yet, and it's just a joy to be with y'all. And it would not be remiss, as Pastor Michael said, to wish you all a happy Easter because it is a season that we are living into for the next 45 or so days. Um, and as such, we begin this worship series because Easter changes everything. And every year we have the blessing of being reminded of that in our liturgical calendar. It changes our understanding of happiness and what our life on earth is all about. And so we begin this series, as uh, Pastor Michael told us last Sunday, happy? Mm? <laughs> he told me that people around the campus were doing that eh? throughout the week, and so you know what I'm talking about. He did it at this service, at the 11 o'clock service, if you were here on Sunday. Um, we will be kind of moving all through scripture in this series, and so we start today in Ecclesiastes. Um, I'm excited to kick off this series with you. That said, Ecclesiastes, a complicated book. Um, when we think about Ecclesiastes, we, we wonder, you know, who wrote this book? What is it about? Um, who is this mysterious figure? Some scholars think it was Solomon. Um, that's, how the, that's how the writing is meant to make us think. And so even if Solomon didn't write these words down, it's sort of using Solomon and his legacy as one of the great monarchs of Israel, someone who accumulated fame and fortune and influence as this writer, someone who was very wise too, and someone who wrote towards the end of his life. So we have this sage preacher preaching to us. Um, so I'll talk more about that in a minute, but let's go ahead and read this scripture. Where this is Ecclesiastes chapter 2, uh, verses 1 through 11. If you have your Bible, you will find Ecclesiastes after Psalms and after Proverbs. It's one of those small books. It's one of the wisdom scrolls. It's usually read in the Jewish tradition um, during the festival of booths, which I think is interesting because we're going to talk today about where is happiness found. It's not in all the stuff. And so this scroll would be written in the Jewish community during a week-long festival where people kind of live in tents outdoors. Um, also one of the most joyful festivals that they celebrate. Um, so let's dive into Ecclesiastes. I said to myself, come now. I will test you with pleasure to find out what is good. But that also proved meaningless. Laughter, I said, is madness. And what does pleasure accomplish? I tried cheering myself with wine and embracing folly, my mind still guiding me with wisdom. I wanted to see what was good for people to do under the heavens during the few days of their lives. I undertook great projects. I built houses for myself and planted vineyards. I made gardens and parks and planted all kinds of fruit trees in them. I made reservoirs to water groves of flourishing trees. I bought male and female slaves and had other slaves who were born in my house. I also owned more herds and flocks than anyone in Jerusalem before me. I amassed silver and gold for myself and the treasure of kings and provinces. I acquired male and female singers and a harem as well, the delights of a man's heart. I became greater by far than anyone in Jerusalem before me. In all this, my wisdom stayed with me. I denied myself nothing my eyes desired. I refused my heart no pleasure. My heart took delight in all my labor, and this was the reward for all my toil. Yet when I surveyed all that my hands had done and what I had toiled to achieve, everything was meaningless, a chasing after the wind. Nothing was gained under the sun. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. I surveyed all that my hands had done and what I had toiled to achieve. Everything was meaningless, a chasing after the wind. As I was preparing this sermon and thinking about who this writer was, I couldn't help but think back to someone I hadn't thought of for years. Back when I was in my 20s, I was a part of a new church plant down in the Montrose area of Houston. And it was a church plant composed mostly of 20-somethings who were early in their career. Um, but among us, there was this man who was a committed part of this new church start. 
He, I think, was in his 70s or 80s. Uh, he had been a, a highly successful lawyer at one of the biggest firms in the city, had acquired a lot of wealth and comfort in his life. Um, and one of the things that we did that first summer when we were planting this community was take turns sharing our stories with one another, kind of talking about what our journey in life had been and what it had, what had brought us to this point and brought us to seek this new faith community. And I'll never forget how he talked about all of the success that he had in his life and how he had chased after success and influence and, and wealth like he was a dog chasing a rabbit. So um, just pursuit so strong in his pursuit, um, undeterred by anything, undistracted by anything. And as he told us about that and all of his impressive accomplishments, he ended by saying, I achieved all of this. And when I finally laid hold of that rabbit I had been chasing and kind of achieved that goal that I had set for myself, got my mouth around it, turns out the rabbit was made of cloth. It was just empty, full of sand. It was nothing. And as he told us this story, he then went on to talk about how he had discovered instead a real meaning in love, in faith, and in following Christ. And so while his presence among us as this sage, wise, learned, older man was unusual, we were so grateful for his wisdom. We didn't always know what to do with him. We don't always know what to do with the writer of Ecclesiastes either. But the writer of Ecclesiastes in uh, the Hebrew called Kohelet, the name of the book is Kohelet, means the one who teaches, the one who gathers people together, the one who gathers ideas and sentences together and teaches them. You might also call this person the preacher, the leader of the assembly, the one who shares the information and disseminates it. Ecclesiastes, this book that is recorded, is kind of a notebook of ideas and philosophical, theological conclusions that are attained by this person, this writer, all about the downside and the upside of life. There's always a lot of tension in Ecclesiastes where you hear all of these wonderful things and what will make us happy, but then you get all of the writer's and yet and buts and contradictions. If we imagine the writer of this book as Solomon, you might recall back in 1 Kings 10 that at one point in time, the queen of Sheba visits Solomon because she has to see for herself if everything she's heard about this figure, this monarch, this great man is true. She wants to test it. She wants to test Solomon with riddles and see if all of his wealth is really everything that she has heard. And so, the wise guy in Ecclesiastes kind of subjects himself to the same tests. He is out to answer the great riddles of life and figure out the answer to the questions like, what matters most in life? Where is happiness found? And why are we here? He's not content just to take up the conventional wisdom and to trust the assumption of what he's been told is most meaningful in life, he sets out to test it himself. And he takes up a pretty scientific method for it in these first chapters, one and two, and even in three, you'll hear about how he pursued this test. He wanted to see if it was true. And then usually, like you would in writing a science report or a science experiment report, you, you state your conclusion and then you describe the experiment. And that's what this passage in chapter two is all about. He says, I set out to see what would make me happy. And I tried this. Turns out there was nothing there. It was meaningless. And then he talks about all of the ways that he disproves that, right? All of the ways that he found out that the things that he acquired were not the source of happiness. He determines that acquiring happiness through wealth, through pleasure, through doing whatever he chooses, is absurd. Absurd. And so he talks about how he did that. He says, I tried cheering myself with wine. I embraced folly. 
I took on great projects, vineyards, gardens, parks, reservoirs. I acquired servant slaves, singers, livestock, silver and gold. And then depending on the translation, you read either treasure chests galore or a harem. I'm not sure how that word is translated in two different ways there, but it is. He says, I refrained from nothing my eyes desired. I refused my heart no pleasure. Friends, this book was written ages ago, but in some ways it is so pointed towards us, is it not? Towards this time that we live in, towards this world and our society. And the writer of Ecclesiastes determines all of it, all of this that I accumulated, that I could say was mine, that I could say I built that, all of it is a chasing after the wind. A chasing after the wind. That Hebrew word that's translated as a chasing after the wind or in some other translation, vanity of vanities, you might have heard that one before, or utterly vain or emptiness, futility or absurdity, the vapor of vapors, that Hebrew word is hebel. And that is one of the most important concepts throughout the whole book of Ecclesiastes. He revisits it. It's mentioned at least 38 times throughout the book of Ecclesiastes, which makes up like half of the times that Hebel is used in all of the Bible. So this theme of chasing after the wind, finding something to be fruitless, finding something to be absurd, is an important thing for us to unpack a little bit. The Bible scholar Robert Alter describes and translates this term hebel. There's so many different ways to understand what this means because there's not one English word that captures what this means in the Hebrew. And so Robert Alter says that it's like herding the wind, herding like a sheepdog would do, trying to contain the wind and keep it in one place. Or he says it's very similar to like when you go outside on one of those rare cool days that we have in Houston and you can see your breath right? It's there and then gone, the moment that it's brought into existence. One of the translations of Hebel says, merest breath, merest breath. All is mere breath. It's gone as soon as it first exists. Gregory of Nyssa, who's an ancient church father, talked about this word Hebel as something that exists only in the utterance of the word. As soon as you say it out loud, it's gone, and its meaning disappears. Only the letters then translate this empty, useless sound. And so, where does that leave us? Is all of these things we pursue, if they are a chasing after the wind, if they're gone as soon as we get them or lay hold on them, are they bad? Are we to avoid them? Are we to live these miserable, dour lives without having a way to provide for ourselves or find happiness or joy? You might ask the question, is pleasure bad? There are a lot of faith communities that have made this dualism in our history as a Christian church, thinking that if all of these things are not where we find happiness, then surely we must be meant to just exist in the spiritual realm to not tend to our needs as embodied people, to not tend to the joy, the pleasure, to enjoy all of creation, right? Pleasure is not bad, but it cannot be the source of our happiness. But it's not bad. After all, think about the very next book in the Bible, as ours is ordered, is the Song of Songs, which is a celebration of joy and enjoyment and pleasure right? Or you can think about how Jesus himself didn't shy away from enjoying himself at a wedding, even improving the quality of the water so that others might also enjoy themselves. And then even in the next chapter of Ecclesiastes, the writer writes, I know that there's nothing better for them but to enjoy themselves and do what's good while they live. Moreover, this is the gift of God, that all people should eat, drink, and enjoy the results of their hard work. Sometimes that's translated, you know this, eat, drink, and be merry, right? We like this part of Ecclesiastes. This part is easier for us to celebrate and to claim and to enjoy it. 
After all, some of us find ourselves in this experiment that the writer is taking on. Robert Towner, who is a Bible scholar, wrote, Many of us see a familiar sight as the teacher king, the writer Kohelet, sets out determinedly to do all the things that pleasure-loving people, hedonists, even affluent upper-middle-class Americans have always done. He tries to find meaning and happiness in property, in produce, in wealth, and in sex. And furthermore, he craftily brings the whole effort under the rubric of a work ethic. We all could admire this writer for all that he has accomplished. He hasn't been lazy, he hasn't squandered his gifts or the resources that he started out with, but he made the most of them. We love that Protestant work ethic, to make hay while the sun shines, to earn all we can, to find success. This writer can say, I made all of these things. I bought, I gathered, I got. And he rightly gets to enjoy the fruits of his labor. What's wrong with that, right? But friends, the trouble goes back to that term, that hebel. These things are vapor breath. They're gone in an instant. They're not the source of lasting happiness. Jesus told a parable in the Gospel of Luke. Jesus, who would be familiar with this scroll because, again, it was read aloud at least once a year in the community during the Festival of Booths. So Jesus tells this parable, and listen, you will hear some familiar words from Ecclesiastes in this parable from Luke 12. A certain rich man's land produced a bountiful crop. He said to himself, what will I do? I have no place to store my harvest. And then he thought, here's what I'll do. I'll tear down my barns and build bigger ones. That's where I'll store all my grain and goods. I'll say to myself, you have stored up plenty of goods, enough for several years. Take it easy. Eat, drink, and enjoy yourself. But God said to him, fool, tonight you will die. Now who will get the things you have prepared for yourself? This is the way it will be for those who hoard things for themselves and aren't rich towards God. Take heed and beware, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of the things he possesses, according to the words of Jesus. So is he who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich towards God. As they say, friends, you can't take it with you. Right? That's why most of us think that the writer of Ecclesiastes must have been in his older years of life, must have understood these things. And I do this myself. I won't um, rely on any of you to make this confession, but I will. And I think that we all do. My closet is so jam-packed with clothes that I can hardly find what I need. I think to myself, maybe I should get a bigger closet. I have so much when I come home from Costco that I have to figure out where to put all of this extra stuff. I am the man looking to build a bigger barn. We often, when we lead funerals for people and hear about their lives and how they were loved and appreciated and hopefully well-remembered, when we hear about that, it's not stories about how they had so many things, how they had acquired so much influence or wealth. We hear about people making a difference when they have lived a long life and their loved ones can speak to the way that they knew what really mattered in life, to the ordering of their loves, as you would say. The capacity to enjoy life is a gift from God. But we must place that pleasure and that enjoyment in the right context. Happiness is not a product of our own hustling, our own doing, our own acquiring, but of the grace of God. It's all grace. St. Augustine wrote about this. He defined sin as disordered love. Disordered love, giving one's heart too much to things which are not worthy of it and giving one's heart too little to that which is worthy. In Psychology Today, 
which I would remind you is a secular magazine, there was an article about Augustine's Disordered Loves, written by Mike Austin, who summarizes this by saying, our fundamental problem, according to Augustine, has to do with love. Our problem is misplaced love. We love the wrong things, or we love the right things in the wrong way. For example, we wrongly love power, fame, wealth, appearance, and many other things that are unworthy of our love. We also love things that are worthy of love, such as other individuals. But if we do this in an excessive manner, putting others into a place reserved for God, we make a serious mistake and undermine our own happiness. If we love God first and foremost, believes Augustine, this will work itself out in our lives as all of our other loves will become properly ordered. We will still love others, the creation, and the other good things in life, but in the right way and to the right extent. So for those who share Augustine's belief in God, we would say, he would say, that in order to be truly happy, we need properly ordered loves, which we can only achieve as we embrace the spiritual life in deeper ways. There is some work for us to do here, but also being formed in the image of Christ, following after him, dying and being raised with Christ, a lot of that legwork has been done for us. We can rest in the grace of God and know that if we just stay near to Christ, the rest will work itself out. When Charles Spurgeon read this passage from Ecclesiastes and tried to figure out what was in it for us as Christians. He wrote, as Charles Spurgeon does, in a very eloquent way, these words, nothing can satisfy the entire man but the Lord's love and the Lord's own self. Saints have tried to anchor in other roadsteads, but they have been driven out of such fatal refuges. Solomon, or the writer of Ecclesiastes, the wisest of men, was permitted to make experiments for us all, to test it, to see what really made for happiness. Here is his testimony in his own words. Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. And Spurgeon says, what? The whole of it vanity? O favored monarch, is there nothing in all thy wealth? Nothing in that wide dominion reaching from the river even to the sea. Nothing in Palmyra's glorious palaces. Nothing in the house of the forest of Lebanon. In all thy music and dancing and wine and luxury, is there nothing? Nothing, he says, but weariness of spirit. This was his verdict, which he had trodden the whole round of pleasure. To embrace our Lord Jesus, to dwell in his love, and be fully assured of union with him, this is all in all. Dear reader, Spurgeon goes on, you need not try other forms of life in order to see whether they are better than the Christians. If you roam the world around, you will see no sights like the sight of the Savior's face. If you could have all the comforts of life, if you lost your Savior, you could be wretched. But if you win Christ, then should you rot in a dungeon, you would find it paradise. Should you live in obscurity or die with famine, you will yet be satisfied with favor and full of the goodness of God. Now, we don't stand much in danger of rotting in a dungeon these days or of dying in famine. But I think that in all of Spurgeon's words right here, our biggest fear, that thing that plucks the cord within us and stings a little bit, might be that possibility of living in obscurity. We all, to a certain extent, fear living in obscurity. So we hustle to make ourselves worthy. We hustle to make ourselves known, to show up, to do our best, right? I don't know if this resonates with you, but it does with me. I always appreciate Brene Brown's work on unpacking what this means to hustle for worthiness and to strive to prove that we're worth whatever it is. 
that's in front of us, someone's friendship or notoriety or possessions. Instead, as Christians, we need to remember that grace will take us places that hustling cannot. That grace will take us and bring us comfort and will bring us joy and will bring us happiness. This is a good word to myself in the midst of a busy weekend where it's so tempting to hustle and to show up and show out. For the people in our community and in our midst, I had a really great evening last night. My, uh, my oldest kid was in the Spring Forest Middle School's production of Guys and Dolls. They had closing night last night, stayed up too late, ate Thai food at 11.30 p.m. Not my best choice, but I cannot get this image out of my head. Well, one, I'm a super proud mom, and all of those kids in that show did amazing. Um, but it was such a joy to watch your kid work so hard for something. And while there is some hustle to that, right, the hard work these kids put in, the image that I can't get out of my head is in the final scene, my kid played Nathan Detroit, if you know the story, he and Adelaide, probably in adult productions, maybe they kiss at the end, I don't know, they hugged at the middle school. They go in, they hug, and they're frozen there. And I saw the person who was playing alongside him as his Adelaide last night, um, they go in for the hug, as they usually do, and they freeze. And in the, in the peak of all of that hard work and celebration and joy, the thing that I think will stay with me, and, and hopefully with them too, is that stage hug, there was a little moment where it turned into a real hug. A friend hugging a friend, celebrating a job well done, celebrating joy and life and relationship. I hope that it's that way for us, that even in the midst of busyness, we order our lives and our loves right, where I don't fret too much about showing up here and having a dazzling sermon because instead I was spending time with my family. And it's so hard to go and work against that inclination to show up and show out, but instead to look for those moments of connection and relationship and those moments where Christ is at work in us and through us. In the third chapter of Ecclesiastes, we read these words that remind us of the importance of relationships and the importance of what will really make us happy. God has made everything fitting in its time. There's room for all of it, friends. But he has also placed eternity in our hearts. I'm reminded of Pastor Michael's sermon last Sunday that all of us have this thing within us that can only be filled with God, that can only be satisfied, made full with the presence of God in our lives. Eternity has been placed in our hearts. And so today, if your pursuit of happiness has left you feeling as empty as a tomb, as empty as a grave, then friends, come on out, because there is more to life there is more to life than the pursuit of all of the things that we read about in Ecclesiastes. Nothing can make us happy. That sounds fatalistic, and it sounds negative, and it sounds depressing. But it's actually liberating, because no thing can make us happy. No thing can make us happy, but we can find happiness that is real and lasting and joyful in relationships and in contentment, and most of all, in Christ. How can we expect to be satisfied with the fleeting, with the vapor of vapors, with that breath, when eternity has been placed in our hearts? We're called to live differently, and we are invited into that life abundant. Let's pray. Gracious and holy God, one who was always with us. We give you thanks for today and for this invitation to come on out of those empty and hollow graves and into the light of Christ, into a life of abundance and joy. 
Help us, God, to find those pathways of grace and happiness in all that we do. Amen. Amen.